Amen. And so this morning, we're going to talk about uh, baptism because we have a baptism today. Amen. Give God praise for that. Amen. Today, we're going to have our baptism service. And so I'm so thankful uh, for baptism. I want us all to understand, and I think we will by the time that we leave here today, the importance of Christian baptism. Amen. It's not something that we do just because we do it. It's something that God has ordained for us to do. It's something that uh, he told Jesus to do, and we know that Jesus was baptized by John. And when you think about the baptism of Jesus Christ, you have to understand that he wasn't baptized for the re forgiveness of sins or the repentance of sins because the Scripture says that he was without sin. Amen. So he did, uh, he experienced water baptism so as a pattern for us to experience water baptism. Amen? Amen. And so God is good, and so I'm uh, uh, kind of wanting to get to a couple of things this morning. Uh, I want to talk in, in general terms, and we'll, then we'll talk about specific terms. Uh, I just want to make sure, and it's the teacher on the inside of me, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to water baptism. And I want to take some time this morning just to talk about different baptisms in the Bible. I'm not going to spend too much time on the other two. I think we're going to talk about three baptisms this morning. Then we'll end up uh, talking about water baptism. Amen? So we'll talk about, in generalities, we'll talk about baptisms, and then we'll get specific to water baptism. Amen? How many people in here have been water baptized? Amen. That you can remember. <laughs> Amen. I got baptized when I was a child, and I got baptized, I don't know if you guys remember those little blue pools that you had for your kids. That's the pool that I was baptized in. And it worked. I'm just telling you, it, it worked. And so I, I, I made my profession of Jesus Christ. Uh, and at the time, we didn't have a baptism pool. So my pastors dunked me in the pool, the kiddie pool. But you know what? It, it worked. I'm here to tell you that my life has been changed ever since. Amen? And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 6. If you have your Bible, your tablet, your pad, your iPhone, Hebrews chapter 6, if not, it's on the screen behind me. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And let's go back to verse 1. It says, so therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. And so the writer of Hebrews is encouraging those who are reading the text to move on from, there are some things as a Christian, the doctrinal things of Christianity you should have underneath your belt. Amen. And so God should be able to talk to you about other things now because you have that as your foundation. And so I love the way the writer of Hebrews begins to point this out. He says, we leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Notice, we don't necessarily leave them, but what we do is that we glean from the things that we have learned and we take them with us. It's just like going to high school. And so you go to high school and when you leave high school, you don't leave everything you learned from high school. Because the things that you learned in high school will help you become a mature person. Is this making sense? So he says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Say perfection. So the goal of the Christian life is to have a foundation of Jesus Christ. Allow Jesus to begin to build on that foundation, therefore taking you into perfection. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. It says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Verse 2, it says, of the doctrines of baptisms. And if you notice, baptisms has an S. It's plural. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It says, and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And so one of the things that I just want to quickly point out now, we look at verse 2, it talks about baptisms. This morning, I want to talk about three baptisms, and I want us to all understand 
what we're going to actually hopefully witness today. And I don't know how many people uh, are going to take part in our baptism service, but it's going to be immediately after our, our morning worship. And so we're going to go over to our, our baptism pool that we have uh, uh, a partnership with First Church this morning. I want to thank God for them. Thank God for First Church. Amen. So they allowed us to use their, their baptism. And we're going to talk about some things that I think are going to really uh, bless you. And so when it comes to leaving the principles of Christianity, I want you to understand that when you come to church, you're coming to church to learn something. Learning something that then will help you to become a mature Christian. A lot of us come to church and we hear an inspiring message. Some of us get excited. Some of us begin to build our knowledge base. But I don't know if we actually put into practice the things that we learn in church. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, you know what, we need to leave these foundational doctrine things behind us so that God can begin to use us in life. Is this making sense to anybody? Amen. You know, I remember when my, uh, my daughter was in, I think she was, either, she was had to be in, in elementary school, maybe the first grade or second grade, and we went to a drive through uh, and we ordered uh, something from the drive through let's say it was, you know, $3.75. And my, my daughter was probably six or seven at the time, and we asked Jasmine to, to we, you know, because we were going to pay with the $5 bill, and we asked her, how much change should we get back? And she looked kind of puzzled. But we knew that she had learned the principle. It's just that now it was different in learning the principle and actually applying it in real life. Is this making sense? Because when we come to church, we learn the principles, but sometimes it doesn't manifest in real life. And so my wife and I, we were laughing. We're like, yeah, the, the, these are the things that, that you learn in school, but now you're going to have to apply them. I don't know if you've ever had the uh, uh, opportunity to go into a convenience store and what you pay for, you pay something for $3.25 and, and, and you give the clerk a $5 bill uh, and they put it in and they're getting ready to give you your change and then you say, oh, I got a quarter. And, and the, the look, on the expression of some clerks, they're like, like, they, I mean, so we, they went from $3.75. They were prepared to give you your $1.25, but when you came back with a, with a quarter, it, it blew them off. Is this making sense? So, so these are the things that we learn, but we have to put them into practice. Say practice. And so the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 6 in the New Living Translation, I just want to read it. It says, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds. So that's, that's the first thing that the, that the writer of Hebrews wants those who, in, who are reading his text to understand is that there are five or six doctrinal principles that he's writing to them about. The first one is repenting from evil. And so anyone knows that that's where it starts. You have to repent and say, God, I'm sorry for everything that I have done. That's a doctrinal, foundational truth. The next thing is, number two, is placing your faith in God. And so notice, he says, let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again, and let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. He says, repenting of evil deeds, placing our faith in God. The next one, he says, is you don't need further instruction about baptisms because it was something that they should have already understood. The next one is the laying on of hands, and we won't have time to cover all of these, but I'm telling you, there's something profound and something powerful when men and women of God and parents begin to pray for you and they begin to lay their hands on you. There are things that begin to open up in your life. There are things that begin to uh, be, you begin to be empowered for certain things, and you're like, I, don't, I didn't feel this way before until they prayed for me, and you know that there's something powerful about Laying on of hands, right? And then it says the resurrection of the dead. That's a doctrinal truth. The Bible says that if we are alive and remain, we will be caught up in the, with the Lord in the air to meet him. That, that's a doctrinal truth. That's the resurrection of that and eternal judgment. If you do not accept Christ and go to heaven, the alternative is 
that we don't talk that much about. But the alternative is if there's a heaven, then there's got to be a hell. And so that's an eternal judgment. And, and so you just notice the doctrinal principles that the writer is, is laying out. And so you must have doctrine so you can be sound in your faith. I don't know how many people give credence to actually daily Bible reading and prayer and meditation. And so now I know you go on IG and you get your daily inspirational scripture, but I don't know if you actually meditate on it and let God talk to you about it because those are the things that begin to help build your foundation. Say foundation. God wants you to have a foundation that when he builds on it, it's going to be sturdy. It's going to be stable. Is this making sense to anybody? I've known a lot of people that they started out, but they are not sturdy. They were not stable. One of the reasons that God wants you to have a foundation that's sturdy and stable is because he's going to work with you. He's going to work with your lust. He's going to work with your greed. He's going to work with your ethics. He, y'all don't want to talk to me. He's going to work with your character. He's going to work with your integrity. He's going to work with all of those things. And so some of us, we're just happy that someone came with a big Dolisi truck and parked and put all the concrete in, and we're ready to build, but the concrete is still wet. So it's good enough for you to write your name in it, but it's not good for you to build something on it. Is this making sense? And a lot of us take more pleasure in writing our name in wet concrete than we do in actually waiting for it to dry and let God talk to us and to build something in us that will never go away. Is this making sense? And so God has some things for us today, and we're going to get into it. And so the Bible says this, that he wants us to be perfected. So the Greek word for perfection is teleotis. Say teleotis. And it actually means mature. So in Scripture, when you see the word perfect, it doesn't mean that you are perfect and without fault. It just means that you're striving to get better every single day. It becomes, you mean, you are now becoming more mature in your faith. The things that used to bug you don't bug you. The people that used to bug you don't bug you. All of the attitudes that you used to have and all of the expressions that you used to, all of the finger expressions and all those expressions, hopefully you're becoming more mature. Some people didn't know what the finger expressions are, but hopefully you're becoming more mature in your faith. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that God wants us to get there because he doesn't want you to get saved and resaved every week. So so, uh, Barnes, the commentary Barnes notes on the Bible says, the writer wants to point them or aim them toward perfection. He wants to aim them toward perfection even if it is never fully realized in their life. Perfection or maturity is your goal. Whether or not you get there or not, it's still the goal. There is nothing wrong with making an honest attempt to live as godly as you can. Part of that includes water baptism. Well, you you say, Pastor Randy, how does it include water baptism? It includes water baptism because we are obedient to what God has called us to do, and that includes water baptism. Because I've had, and, 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 and you'll understand where I'm coming from, I've had people and we, we've, we've uh, agreed to disagree about water baptism and how it should work and who, how should you, what profession should you make over water baptism. I'm not here to challenge you on water baptism and in whose name you should be baptized in. Should it be Jesus' name? Should it be the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost? Uh, should you be sprinkled? Should they pour water on you? Or should you be submerged? I have my own opinion. I think we're going to get into the Word of God. I want to help answer those questions for you. Amen? But I want you to understand this. Don't be satisfied to continue learning principles at the cost or the expense of pursuing progress. So when God gives you principles and you get them underneath your belt, He only gives you principles so that you can progress. And so progression is the application of principles and the pursuit of of it. Amen. Say amen to that. And and so this morning, I just want to talk about a couple of baptisms. And so uh, the Bible says this. um, We're going to get to, well, let me start with this one. Uh, Baptized in the Greek comes from the word baptizdo. It means to dip, to sink, submerge, to immerse, literally to dip under, and it implies 
submersion to make fully wet. That's why when you get baptized today, you're going to be fully wet. And, and I know some of you may come with that little shower cap on, but it's, it's not going to work because you're going to get fully wet, right? And so you'll get fully submerged because from the Greek language, that's where the word comes from. Is this making sense? And, and so, but do I fault people who sprinkle? I don't. I just know that if you get baptized here in this ministry, we're going to dunk you. And, you, and when you get up, you're going to be wet, right? You're going to know that you have been baptized. And, and so the New American Standard Greek lexicon, let me tell you this, this is so good. It means to dip, to dip in, immerse, and it means to dip as in to dip into dye. Dye, D-Y-E, meaning a color. And so historically, that when you wanted to change your garment's color, you would get some dye, you would put it in a bathtub or whatever your reservoir was, and you would put your red garment into the dye, and then it would turn purple because that's the color that you wanted it. It's going to make sense in a minute. So, so as a Christian, once we accept Jesus Christ, we're water baptized. And when we're water baptized, God begins to color us anew. So when we go into the water, we're actually going into the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the old man has been passed away. And now when we come up, all things are become new. God, God has died you. Say dip, dip. and die. So it's D-I-P and D-Y-E. But you know what? One of the things that we find out after we have been born again is that when we go in the water, there's a D-I-E experience. That, that when we dip, we come out because we have to die to ourselves in order to be used by God. And so God wants to change your color. And so if you're yellow, red, black, or white, he wants us all to be the same color. So he wants to dye you in the blood of Jesus Christ. He wants to work a work in you from the inside out. That would be enough to change your life forever. Amen. Is this making sense? So you didn't know that when you got baptized, you were dying to yourself. That you know what? You said, I've accepted Jesus Christ. I no longer live for myself. The Apostle Paul said it this way. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, but it's not me that lives, but it's the Christ that lives within me. Do I have an amen in here anywhere? And so that is... So, so we transition to the first baptism. So the first baptism that I want to talk about is actually the spiritual baptism performed by the Spirit. It's performed by the Holy Spirit at the very moment of salvation. It's something the Holy Spirit does when you accept Jesus Christ. When you accept Jesus Christ, he baptizes you into the body of Jesus. So, so that means your family has now been extended. Because once you get born again, you accept Jesus Christ, he baptizes you into the body of Christ with all the other believers. So you may have brothers and sisters that you did not know you had until you accepted Christ and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. And let me go through these right quick. John chapter 6, verse 44, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. Meaning you can't even come to Jesus unless God the Father quickens your heart. And once he quickens your heart, he then turns you over to the Holy Spirit who then baptizes you into the body of Christ. The Bible says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it, verse 13, it says, some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 says this, and he is the head of the body, talking about Jesus Christ, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So notice, we're baptized into the body. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, and he's the head of the body. He's the head, we're the body. Does this make sense? And so Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 says, from whom the whole body 
fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What is the scripture saying? It said that once you're baptized into the body, now you're there and you are able to give what you have to the other joints in the body. Remember the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, it says, the eye can't say to the ear, I have no need of thee, nor can the foot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. And so God not only performed the body, the outward body, but he performed all the inward workings of the body. Is this making sense? And so you have to find your place in the body of Christ. You were not saved to be alone. You were saved to be a part of a body, and there are other body members counting on you and depending on you for what you supply. Just make it sense. Isn't it something? That's why the enemy wants there to be division in the body, and that's why he wants you to be mad at them and they to be mad at you because what you have, they won't get if you're mad at them, and what they have, they won't give to you if you're mad. And so that's why he says everybody has been baptized into this body. Amen. Side note, just a side note, that when you're baptized into the body, the body, the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's where we get all our gifts. That the Spirit of God gives to the man, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. The Spirit of wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. Another word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. It's the same Spirit. Once He baptizes you into the body of Christ, He equips you. Amen? Say first baptism. So, so let me move on to the second baptism, and we're going to have three, so don't get nervous. We're not going to be here that long. So we have the second baptism is performed by Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, in the New Living Translation, it says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming who is greater than I, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. We know this is John talking. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So there's another baptism. So, so once you accept Jesus Christ, now you're placed into the body of Christ. And Jesus wants to give you the Holy Spirit as a baptism. Now, 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 I know some of y'all are like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want that Holy Spirit because I've seen people with that Holy Spirit and they just start running and bucking and dancing and, and screaming and hollering and shouting. I'm a little bit more reserved with my Holy Spirit. And, and I don't know if I want all of that, but the Holy Spirit is the God in the earth that's going to give you power to overcome every challenge that faces you on any given day. Remember, Jesus said, I'm gone, but I'm leaving you another comforter. I'm leaving you a paraclete, one that's called alongside to help you as you transition through life. Because everybody has a journey. There will be some days that your journey is good. And then there will be other days that your journey is not so good. But we have a comforter that will take us through the good and the bad. Say Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Some people are still scared of them, you know, because, but, but I, I come from old school where people had the Holy Ghost, they, they couldn't even talk. They were like, oh, and I'm like, is that the, I don't know if I want, if that's the Holy Ghost, I don't know, I want to be able to talk. I, I, and then I've had some people that told me, hey, Holy Spirit will do exactly what you allow him to do. Amen. Is this making sense to anybody? That, that he, will, uh, he will do with whatever you allow him to do. Footnote, 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 because I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there, there, there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Oh, 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 I feel a tomato spirit. I feel a tomato spirit. Don't, don't. Well, speaking in tongues is not the telltale sign that you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is a sign that you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the only sign. You know, I've lived long enough to see people that talk in tongues also say some other things 
that goes against Scripture because the Bible says in the book of James that bitter water and sweet water should not come from the same stream. But I've seen tongue talkers made me do a double take just to see like, y'all don't want to talk to me. And by, by the, the smiles on your faces, I think I'm not alone who have, I, I mean, I think you have seen people just like that. Amen? And so the Bible says this, Acts chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. It's for you, whether you want it or not, whether it's been presented to you or not. There is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus wants to give you. Someone who will live on the inside of you. He will walk with you. He will talk with you. He will wake up with you. He will go to bed with you. When your spouse doesn't treat you the way that they need to treat you, he will comfort you. He will not only comfort you, he will comfort them. And so how many know you can't make your spouse apologize? They have to apologize. So you have to allow the Holy Spirit to talk to them. You, you can't go and put your hands on them saying, you need to apologize to me. It takes the Holy Spirit talking to them. If you ever had challenges raising children, you know it takes the Holy Spirit to talk to them. After you've said all you can say, you said it all kinds of ways, you said it kind of really nice and monotone, and then you were raising, you know, you were screaming at the top of your lungs. It takes the Holy Spirit for them to come back and say, you know what, Mama, I was... I was wrong. And you're like, oh, there is a God. There is, there is a God. I've been telling you that for five years. There, there is a God. Amen. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 8, verse 14. It says, now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Notice they had received the word, so now they're baptized into the body, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he, had, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. I, I could preach on this for a while, but I, I'm just going to say this, that there is a transference of the Holy Spirit. God wants to use you as a conduit to impact other people's lives, and you ought to have the confidence that when I pray a prayer, God hears me. And there's a transfer of power that when I begin to, because there are some people that pray for you, and then there are other people, when they touch you, you know that you've been touched. Is this making sense? That your life changes. Amen. And so that's the second baptism. So, so the third baptism is performed by believers into water, which is why we are here today. It's the burying of the old man and the old nature, and it's the beginning walk of the new man and the new nature. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, Verse 18, it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's our job. Do you know we're having a baptism service today, but if you could not come to church and you accepted Christ, you could be baptized at home in your bathtub. Just as long as you're submerged. <laughs> You're like, well, I don't know about that. Yeah, 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 you can. See, baptism is just not for pastors to do. The Bible says that we all should go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. Amen. See, water baptism was administered to Jesus by John the Baptist. That's what we started off by saying. Not that Jesus had sinned, but it was a pattern for us. Amen. 
The Bible says this in Acts chapter 8. I just want to see, want you to understand the natural flow of events. Acts chapter 8, the Bible says, verse 12, it says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. The Bible says this, Acts chapter 8. Notice, they, once they believed, they were baptized. Once you accept Christ, you should be baptized. That's, that's the natural flow. That's the natural current, or current of event. So, in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says, uh, verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, You've been preaching Jesus. I've accepted Jesus. They were riding in a chariot. So the eunuch looks over, sees a pool of water, and says, Hey, is there anything that now stops me from getting baptized? So, so notice, once he accepted Christ, baptism was the next step. Verse 37, and Philip said, if thou believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. That's King James Version for stop. <laughs> and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Once you accept Christ, you should look to be baptized. It's not an option. It is something that our Lord wants us to do. Yes, Amen. Amen. And, and so, uh, one of the things that strikes me about baptism, and, and I'll say this, if, if there is one word that begins to characterize baptism, it's the word identification. Because when you get baptized, what you are saying is, I now identify with Jesus Christ. And I want to do it publicly. The same way when you get married. When you get married, you, st you not only you are, are you love, you know, you love your boo. I understand you love your boo. But, but then you get married and you have witnesses there because you want to pledge your love to them. And some people write their own vows and, and they have these elaborate ceremonies and they want you to be a part of it because they are saying, I love this person and I don't care who sees me when we get married. Don't you know, see, the marriage ring is not the marriage. It's just a sign that I am married. I'll, I'll let that sink in. So water baptism doesn't make you saved. It's a sign that you are saved. And you've done it publicly. You're saying, I identify with Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I identify with his birth. I identify with his life. I identify with his teaching, his miracles, his message, his method. I identify with his ascension. I identify with him descending. The Bible says he went into the lower parts of the earth. He took hell captive. Y'all don't, don't want to talk to me. It says, I identify with his passion, the passion week of Christ. I, I identify with his crucifixion. I identify with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's why when you get baptized, they said, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. I am now identifying with Jesus Christ in his burial and his resurrection. Is this making sense? Because what else do you identify with? I identify with what he has done in my life after I have been saved. He is the doctor who's never lost the case. He's the lawyer that's never lost a trial. The old folks said he's been my burden bearer and my heavy load sharer. He has been a heart fixer and a mind regulator. He's the Messiah. He's holy. He's righteous. He's king of kings. He's the lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Passover lamb. He's the bread of life. He has fed me when I didn't have enough money to buy my own bread. He's the door of the sheep. He's the one who opened up the door and let me in. He's the way, the truth, the life, the true vine. The Bible says he is the true vine. His father is the husbandman. That's who I identify with. 
Can I get an amen in here? That's who I identify with. He was a friend to Peter. He was a confidant to John. He was the resurrection to Lazarus. He was a teacher to Nicodemus. He was living water to the woman at Samaria. He was Mary's baby. He was the Pharisee's nemesis. He was Judas's truth. He was Pharaoh's I am. He's been a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to me. He has been the Alpha and the Omega in my life. He has been all-sufficient. He is the Ancient of Days, the Anointed One, my Baptizer, the Blessed Hope, the branch out of a dry ground. This is who we identify with. When you accept Jesus Christ and then you are baptized, you are baptized into a resurrected Jesus Christ. He's the brightness of his glory. He's the image of the incorruptible God. He's been a shield and a buckler. He's the captain of my soul. He's the champion in battle. He's the chief shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's my confidence. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. He's been a counselor to me. The Bible says he's a consuming fire. He was the cornerstone that the builders rejected. He's the creator. He's the day spring. He's the day star. He's the deliverer. Elohim is his name. El Elyon is his name. El Shaddai is his name. He's the eternal God that once you get baptized, you now live forever. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Once you accepted Jesus Christ, you live now forever. Your spirit lives forever. He's the first. He's the last. He is the first begotten of God, the firstborn from the dead. He's the fountain of living water. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Y'all don't want to talk to me. If you had bad days, he's the God of all comfort. He's the God who cannot lie. God always causes us to triumph. He's the God who is, who was, and is to come. He tries our heart, he raises the dead, he gives us victory, he sees all, he knows all, he still has the key of David in his hand. In the Bible, in the, Re the book of Revelation, it says he holds the seven stars, he rides the white horse, he was the ransom for us. He is still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ask or think. He's still able to keep you from falling. He's able to present you faultless. He's higher than the highest. He's able to establish you. He's the righteous judge. He keeps you and he keeps Israel. He keeps my soul. And when people close doors, he still opens doors that no man can close. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. He's my praise. He's my redeemer. He's my refuge. He's my portion. He's my high tower. He's my hiding place. He's my help. He's been a friend to me. He's been a shelter in the time of storm. This is the identification that you have when you get born again. This is the knowledge you need to have that once I get baptized, my life will be changed forever. I'm part of something bigger than me now. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Let me give you some more. So he's a secret keeper. He's a promise keeper. He's my kinsman redeemer. He's undeniable. He's indescribable. He's a COVID keeper. When, when people were not here, God still saw fit that you're here. He has kept you. He has kept you. He was the lamb that was slain. He was the lamb of God. He's the last Adam. I thank God that he's the lifter of my head. On your worst day, he's still there. He's the lifter of your head. He's the light of the world. He's the living bread, the living God, the living stone, the Lord of lords, and the Lord of hosts is who he is. You didn't know that that's what happened when you got baptized, did you? That you begin to identify with who he is. They sung it this morning. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Oh, how precious is the name of the Lord. Amen. 
I got to let this go. I, 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 I got to let it go because we're going to be done. So, so he's my protector, my provider. He's my shield. He's my wisdom. And he's coming again. He's coming again. This has to be part of your Christian foundation that you know that he is coming again. If you're blessed to live your 60 years, your 70 years, your 80 years, your 90 years, your 100, your 105, your 110, you still have to realize that he's still coming again. So whether you are here when he comes back or you die and meet him in the air, he's coming again. And you want to be ready when he comes. Turn to your neighbor and ask them, do you know him? <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and ask him, do you know him? This, this is who you need to know, and this is who you need to identify with. So, so if you're going to identify with anybody, you need to identify with him. Yeah, I know you like identifying with Jordan. You wear your Jordans. I know you like Tommy Hilfiger. You like identifying with Tommy Hilfiger. I know you like identifying with Ralph Lauren. But, you know, there is someone that's greater than all of them that you need to identify with. If you're going to get a shirt representing anybody, it needs to be the shirt of Jesus Christ. If you're going to wear a jersey supporting any team, it needs to be the team that you've just been baptized in. Because you're part of a bigger team that's international. You don't want to, you got brothers and sisters across the sea. You just never met them. But they've accepted Jesus. We're family. We'll stand. We'll stand. There's no God like our God. There is no God like our God. If you don't know him today, I just want to give you a quick opportunity to meet Jesus Christ because this is where it all starts. Once you meet him, the Holy Spirit will baptize you into his body. You will find your place. You will be one of those joints that supplies what someone else needs. Isn't it something that God put us all here? Do you think he put us all here so that we can go around one another? Or do you think he put us here so that we can know one another and we can share with one another? that you can invite people over to your house and you can be a host and a hostess and you know more about them and they know more about you. And at some point in time, you may need them and they may need you. See, belonging to Christ, being part of Christendom is, is I'm old, don't get mad at me, but it's, it's bigger than a fraternity better than a sorority. You, you should have people who love you. The, the Bible says this, that there, there is such a love out there that Jesus said there's no greater love than a man that would give his life for a friend. When you're part of the body of Jesus Christ, you should not have any hurts or wants that someone else should not be able to help you with. Is this making sense? If you don't know Jesus, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. You can just repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come as a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, use me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I would confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in my heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, I would be saved. Father, today I confess and I believe. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Give God hand praise in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today. Impact Community Church is located at 4400 Northwest Expressway, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in the Cole Community Center. We would love to have you come worship with us. Our service time is at 1030 a.m. on Sundays. We pray this message has been a blessing to you. If you would like to sow into the ministry, we have three options for you to give. You may go to our website at www 
www.impactcc.org. Text to give at 405-266-5020. Or you can mail a check or money order to Impact Community Church, P.O. Box 121, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73101. 